are monitoring a pretty swift sell-off in the broad markets right now. The S&P 500 down more than 1%, trading at the lowest level since the beginning of June. And traditional defensive sectors are proving to be not that much of a safe haven. Take healthcare, for example. The S&P 500 healthcare sector is trading at the lowest level since the spring of this year. But our next guest is finding selective opportunities. Let's bring in Robert Moffat, Portfolio Manager at Middlefield Group. Rob, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So you've got this big story in the bond market and you can like a, a, a pipeline of drugs all you want, but it gets caught up in the selling pressure. How do you think about what's going on today? Yeah, I think that to your point, um, everything is pretty much selling off today. Usually days like this, correlations increase and it's kind of a baby out with the bathwater type of situation where even high quality businesses are sold out with the broader market. So it's tough to find places to hide today on a specific day like this, but I do think over the medium term, uh, pharmaceuticals do offer a pretty good place to, to invest. So do you buy now? Do you wait for better entry points? Do you get a kind of a homework list ready? How does it work? Yeah, so I think that we are a little bit worried that the economy is starting to show signs of slowing, um, especially on the consumer. So you have, con um, student repayment loans starting again yeah. this month. The lagged effects of interest rates are really starting to um, show their head. So I think that right now, if you are investing in the market, you want to be taking a bit more of a defensive posture. And yes, today would be a good time to be rotating out of your top E growthier stocks and into a defensive sector like uh, like pharmaceuticals. Okay, so it's interesting you say rotating out because one of your top ideas is Eli Lilly, which screens as, you know, the AI of uh, biopharma because of its exposure to obesity, although today it just did a deal for a cancer drug. Correct. So Eli Lilly, no doubt about it, is a bit more of a growth stock. Um, a lot of that growth is predicated on the excitement around GLP-1 agonists, or what I think a lot of people would call weight loss drugs. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of our viewers have heard of Ozempic and Wagovi, but Lilly has a drug called Manjaro, which has, on a head-to-head -head comparison, has actually shown even better weight loss efficacy than Ozempic. So um, that's where a lot of the growth is coming from. But the acquisition that you saw today, I think, validates the fact that Lilly is more than just a diabetes and obesity company. They have an oncology business, which they're adding to today. They have respirology. They have a very interesting drug in Alzheimer's, yeah. which is potentially getting approved later this year. So um, Lilly's has the benefit Would you of, say it's more diversified than a Novo Nordisk? Absolutely. So Novo Nordisk is more or less a pure play obesity and diabetes company at this point. Over 90% of its revenues come from that specific therapeutic area, whereas Lilly is able to take the cash flows from that, from those franchises and reinvest them into areas like oncology, like we're seeing today. So would you balance an Eli Lilly exposure, um, a growth name with an, Astra, uh, an AstraZeneca and Merck, or would you say those are on the more conservative side? Yeah, so if I were timing the market, not something I would, I would recommend, um, you know, you'd probably wanna buy a name like Merck today and sooner than a company like Lilly. So Merck is trading at around 14 times earnings, and it is one of the most stable, safe, defensive names in pharmaceuticals. Um, its core business has consistently performed very well over the last few years. A lot of that is anchored by Keytruda, which this year will actually be the number one selling drug in the entire world. Hmm. So, What's that for? It's, for on, it's an oncology, oncology drug, yeah. immunotherapy. So Keytruda is protected by patents until 2028, so you have high visibility into cash flow growth for the next five years. Now, it does need a second act and a second leg of growth, but similar to Lilly, they're able to reinvest cash flows from this base business and build out the pipeline, which I'm, I'm really encouraged by recent progress they've been making. And then, so what's the play on AstraZeneca? So AstraZeneca is a UK pharma company, but you can buy the ADR on the NASDAQ. Um, what I like about Astra is that it really is a global company. Only 40% of its sales come from the US, which is much different than a lot of S&P 500 healthcare stocks. And Astra has arguably the best drug pipeline in all of pharma. So they have over 30 different phase three trials ongoing right now. And phase three trials typically take one to four years to, to play out. So we're going to get a steady stream of clinical data over the next four years. Hmm. And those often act as a catalyst. So 
Um, a term that's often used is they have a lot of shots on goal and a lot of things that could cause the, the stock to get um, you know, rated higher. So um, you get a lot of growth at a reasonable price with AstraZeneca. The fact that we're still seeing a, a, a pharma deal on the back of these rate rises, and I would say that pharma M&A has been relatively robust in this rising rate environment. Um, do you expect that to continue because the need for pipeline growth is so strong? Yeah, absolutely. So the setup for M&A in this space is, it, it makes a lot of sense for well-capitalized incumbents like the names that I just mentioned. Um, they do have patent expiries and patent cliffs coming in the next few years. So a great way to offset those, those revenue drop-offs is to go and invest in emerging and earlier stage companies. And right now, a lot of those companies, I'm mostly speaking to mid-cap biotech, yeah. um, they're not able to access capital markets. The venture capital world has dried up. It's tough to get private equity funding. Banks are not lending as much. So a good exit, if you have good science and a good product, is to actually partner or even sell the company to a pharma company that's looking to add innovation to its pipeline. And rates, at, you know, say the U.S. 10 years at 5%, it can, that, that can still hold together, you think? Is there a rate at which yeah. maybe that starts to fall apart? Well, something we're seeing a lot more of is these, these companies, these large pharma companies are partnering with the companies. They'll say, we're going to fund your R&D for the next year and we want a, royal, a percentage of sales or we want... Um, you know, here's an upfront $400 million, but there's milestone payments along okay. the way, and there's an equity ownership structure. So it's not a traditional lending with an interest rate subscribed to it. It's more of a, a partnership model that's taking place.